Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our TIFF Talk Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Andrea Millers, and I am the Senior Director of Marketing Gastric Solutions. Today, I also have the pleasure of uh, having our special guest, Dr. Zabair uh, Malik, um, Malik, sorry. Um, and also we have Wendy Prophet, who is here, who is one of our Endogastric Solutions Market Development Manager. Um, so thank you, Dr. Malik, uh, Malik, and thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we start, I want to remind everyone this is a live event. So at any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to type your question in the comments section and we will do our best to answer any questions for you tonight. Um, so let's go ahead and start before I uh, get into what is GERD and the TIF procedure. I do want to give a little background on Dr. Malik. He earned his medical degree and completed his internal medicine residency and gastroenterology fellowship at Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia, where he currently serves as director of the hospital's esophageal program. He is board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. Dr. Malik's clinical interests include GI motility, Barrett's esophagus, achalasia, eosinophilic esophagitis, gastroparesis, GERD, and the endoscopic TIF procedure for reflux. He practices at the Temple Health Digestive Disease Center in Philadelphia, the Jeans campus of Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia, and at the Temple Health Fort Washington. Again, we can't thank you enough for being here uh, this evening, Dr. Malik. We really appreciate it. Thank you again. Fantastic. Wonderful. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, we uh, generally start kind of explaining what is GERD and what are the symptoms that potential patients could be feeling if they were experiencing um, uh, severe GERD. Okay. So uh, that's a great question. GERD, or what it stands for, gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, is where your stomach contents actually come back from your stomach up into your esophagus. Um, and oftentimes this is with acid that your stomach produces. So it can produce a burning sensation in your chest or your stomach. Sometimes you get a sour taste in your mouth. Um, uh, other times it, it can be just pain. Um, and then there's symptoms that can come that are kind of different than that where you have symptoms like cough or shortness of breath, what we call extraesophageal manifestations, where you can have even trouble breathing or sleep apnea, things like that, that can be made worse from reflux that, that you may not pick up right away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we have patient with the, the latter um, symptoms that you discussed. Would you consider that like atypical symptoms versus typical symptoms? Yeah, the the typical the typical symptoms are your burning, your um, re, like right in the middle of your chest kind of burning pain or a sour taste in your mouth. Um, those are your typical type symptoms. Um, whereas your atypical symptoms are just those coughing, shortness of breath, worsening asthma or lung disease, um, even sore throat or kind of a post nasal drip sometimes even those things can all be some of your atypical symptoms. Sure, thank you. And uh what do you recommend patients to do, you know, before we even get into uh you know s possible surgical options, um what are some things that you recommend patients to do to manage their GERD symptoms, you know, like uh, food aversions, lifestyle modifications or whatnot? Yeah, there, there's a few things you can try. Um, one is to avoid foods that can cause reflux, and those are your usually your spicy or greasy foods um, or acidic type of foods such as tomatoes or orange juice, things like that. Um, certain types of other food can relax your lower esophageal sphincter, which is the, the muscle at the bottom of the esophagus that kind of prevents the reflux from coming up. And uh, items such as like anything with mint or chocolates can do that. Um, so you want to try and avoid those things. Um, other acidic things, coffee, um, 
tea, things like that you want to avoid. And then um, another big one is being overweight. O being overweight can increase your pressure in your belly, which leads to more reflux. So trying to lose weight um, through healthy diet and exercise is can always help reflux. Fantastic. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about uh, medical therapy or PPI or taking kind of, you know, the Tums or the PPIs. Um, would that, would you say that that's kind of the next step if they're still suffering, you know, trying a different lifestyle modifications or whatnot to manage the GERD, but they start taking, you know, what's the next step, if you will? Sure. So usually if, if lifestyle modifications don't work, we try different types of medications. Depends on how frequently you're having symptoms and how severe they are. Um, typically, you can start with a medicine like Tums or Maalox. That's if you have rare symptoms and it's just going to control your rare symptoms. For a little bit more frequent, sometimes we uh, recommend a medicine like famotidine, also known as Pepsid. Um, and But if you're having more frequent symptoms, often we use a class of medicines called PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. That's your omeprazole or pantoprazole, Nexium, Protonix, um, uh, your medicines that go by those different names, Dexalan, things like that. Um, and that would usually be the next step if your symptoms are a little bit more frequent. Okay, wonderful. So uh, can you talk about maybe a little bit about PPIs? I know that there's some patients that are worried about, um, there's a lot of, you know, um, press around long-term use of PPIs. Can you um, touch on that just a little bit, if you don't mind? Sure, yeah. There, there are some studies that have come out that have looked at bad effects of using PPIs for long terms, and some of those effects could be heart disease, kidney disease, right. bone disease, um, Alzheimer's um, are probably the, your biggest ones. Um, and so, you know, the, the data on it is, is kind of mixed. Some of the studies show there is an increased risk, uh, albeit minimal. Other studies show there's no increased risk. So what I tell people is if it's a medicine you need to be on because you have true acid reflux, acid reflux can lead to a lot of other problems, including um, changes in your esophagus called Barrett's esophagus, which can eventually lead to cancer of the esophagus, or you can get uh, strictures, which is narrowings of your esophagus. Um, if you have real reflux, a PPI, the benefits of it far outweigh the risks of using it long term. But if you don't have real reflux and you got started on this medicine for whatever reason, it's important to try and get you off of the medicine. Um, or if you have reflux and you don't necessarily want to stay on it long term because you're young and you want to avoid those risks, it's important to consider another type of way to reduce reflux, and that's usually where we get into anti-reflux type procedures. Right, perfect, thank you. Uh, can, can you talk about, uh, let's talk about what treatment available to treat GERD today, and maybe you can talk about, you know, the whole spectrum, obviously lifestyle modifications, you're starting, then you, you know, PPI or medical therapy, and then where do you move from there, if you will? Yeah, so once you get beyond medical therapy, there's several different options that we have available now. Um, one of them is the TIF, which we're kind of all here for. So transoral incisionless fundoplication. That's where we essentially can do an anti-reflux procedure with a camera scope inside um, going in your mouth to your stomach. And we take part of the stomach and kind of pull it down and wrap it around to make a stronger valve on the inside that prevents reflux. Um, and it works very well. Um, there's little fasteners that are put on the inside. They, they almost look like, you know, the little plastic things where you attach a, a tag to, to new clothes or something like that, except the build is a little different. They're a little stronger than those. They're not going to break. Um, but that's essentially what we use. And we kind of may recreate your valve at the bottom of the esophagus, because usually when you have reflux, you have a weak valve at the, the bottom of the esophagus called a lower esophageal sphincter. So if you can kind of rebuild that, tighten it up a little, reinforce it, you can prevent some of the reflux from happening. So that's one of the choices and the one we're all here to talk about. There are other options as well. There's something called Streta where we kind of 
burn your esophagus to try and prevent reflux. There's And then there's traditional surgeries where a surgeon actually goes in, they make some small incisions on your belly, and they go in and they can do what's a fun duplication, which is that wrap. They take the top of the stomach and wrap it around the bottom of the esophagus, all done with incisions on your belly. Perfect. Thank you very much. Now, uh, you did mention, you know, can you talk a little bit about what is the difference between the TIF procedure that we're talking about today and potentially, you know, the traditional anti-reflux surgery that has the, the Nissen, if you will? There's sure, a lot of yeah. questions, yeah, that come up of the differences between those two. So the, the difference is, one, is how they're done, right? The, the TIF procedure is done with a endoscope, a camera scope, and there's no incisions on your body. A, a traditional Nissen fund application is done with usually laparoscopic incisions, so like four or five very small incisions on your belly. Um, so that's probably your biggest difference. Now, um, a TIF is also what's called a partial fund application, where you can kind of create this wrap or you know this valve that's not that's about anywhere from like 180 to 270 degrees where you can kind of reinforce that valve, but you're not going 360 degrees. A Nissen fund application, on the other hand, is usually 360 degrees. Now, surgeons can also do a partial fund application where they don't go 360 degrees, and there's a lot of different reasons why you would want to do one or the other. The Nissen is the strongest, but if your esophagus muscles are weak or for any reason, you know, you have trouble swallowing, you may not want such a tight wrap at the bottom and there's reasons to do a looser wrap. Um, you know, some of the differences and the other big difference is the risk of side effects with this. Traditional surgery um, comes with an increased risk of damaging your vagus nerve, which is the nerve that runs from your esophagus down to your stomach and it actually controls your stomach movement. And so sometimes damaging that nerve can lead to um, some uh, gastroparesis, which is a slow emptying stomach. And that can lead to symptoms like nausea and vomiting, weight loss, um, feeling full, even sometimes abdominal pain. And so um, the TIF really avoids that because you're not cutting anything. And so you're avoiding damaging that nerve. Um, and that can obviously, um, help reduce some of those side effects. So those are kind of your bigger differences there. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, I'm seeing quite a few questions pop up for you. So I'm going to pass it over to Wendy to ask some of the questions that we're getting on Facebook. Wendy. Thanks, Andrea. Well, Dr. Malik, you have quite a few fans writing in saying you are just the best and uh, they're they're thrilled to see you tonight. Um, so what we have are, um, number one, a, a question. We have folks from Florida, South Carolina, Georgia tuning in, um, more Florida, and uh, they're happy to see you. Um, so I have question number one is, um, how do I know if, if I have GERD, uh, which I think you've done a, a great job of discussing symptoms. Was there anything else that you wanted to touch on there that you hear from patients who might mistake they, they might think they have something in, instead of GERD but it really turns out that it is GERD are there yeah there there's uh, uh you know there's symptoms and then there's testing so the symptoms other symptoms you can you know feel that heartburn uh the burning in your chest or you can have regurgitation where food's coming up um or food or acid is coming up your esophagus from your stomach um you know, some and a lot of people have what's called silent reflux and probably maybe even 20 percent of people that have reflux have that where they don't feel any symptoms, but they're still having it. And that can lead to damage of their esophagus still. Um, so there is specific testing that can be done um, where, where you get reflux testing where there's two different ways of doing it. One is where we clip a little chip into the bottom of the esophagus called a Bravo. It stays in place for a few days and then falls off on its own. That measures acid in there and that can tell us how much reflux you're having. The other thing is something called a 24 hour pH impedance catheter, which is a thin catheter the size of like a mouse wire or something like that that goes in your nose to your stomach. 
it does come out your nose and you you know you wear it around for a day so it looks kind of funny but um it's doable and that one actually that measures reflux and also flow of fluid so it gives us a little bit more information than the bravo but both of those tests are available um and they can help really diagnose GERD and sometimes it can help us determine is your GERD controlled or not because sometimes just a once a day medicine controls it enough and other times you might be on high doses of medicine and we still can't get it under control and you know so sometimes when those are patients that I always tell hey we can't control it with medicines you don't have any other options you need some kind of intervention the people that can get controlled on on medicine sometimes you say you know, it's it's your choice. You can stay on a medicine long term, or you can consider having a procedure done. And get, so, um, those are kind of the things that we talk about usually. Very good. So, so that actually uh, just covered a, a a couple of questions that I, we had from Kim and Latasha asking about those medicines. Are they okay to take long term? They they were a little bit concerned about that. Um, so I appreciate you addressing that. But also, um, I. Latasha is also wondering if a goiter can cause you to have GERD. A goiter, um, I guess if your thyroid function is abnormal, it can slow down your GI motility. And always whenever you slow down GI motility, it can lead to, to reflux. Um, so that's one. The goiter in and of itself usually is higher up. So it would, if anything, you're, you're, you know, if you're going to have GI symptoms with that, a lot of times it's trouble swallowing, not necessarily reflux. So um, that's something a little bit different most of the time. But like I said, if you have very abnormal, abnormal thyroid function, that can lead to some reflux. Good. Thank you. Also, uh, we have Tyler um, asking, well, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, I skipped one question that I need to get to. Tom, is asking if TIF works for LPR symptoms. So that that's a great question. Um, does does it work for LPR symptom? It depends. Sometimes LPR is related to reflux that comes up from the stomach, and other times it's not. So those patients in particular, it's really important to have that full workup done where you determine is this acid reflux or is it not? Because if it's not acid reflux then doing a TIF procedure isn't going to change anything. And there's a chance it might even make things worse at times because you're just making it a little bit harder for things to go down the esophagus. Where on the other side, if you do that testing and you find acid reflux, then yes, absolutely, it can help the LPR. Um, but it, it's, it's important to not jump straight into an acid-reducing procedure if you find LPR without any other evidence of reflux. Thank you. Thank you. I have Lynn asking, can untreated GERD potentially lead to cancer? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, it can lead to cancer of the esophagus. Um, and oftentimes now, um, when by the time you find cancer of the esophagus, it's too late um, to do anything about it. Now, sometimes we do find it early and it can even be removed endoscopically now, meaning we can remove it with a camera scope and not have to do any surgery if you find it early enough. But the longer you let reflux go, the more likely it is that you can develop cancer of the esophagus and the higher risk of it becoming what's called invasive, where we can't remove it endoscopically and it may even spread to the rest of your body. And that requires major surgeries, chemotherapy, radiation, and, and still even with that survival is not great. So, um, if you have things, if you have reflux, it's important to try and do something about it before you get to that point. And also, so so leading up to that, there's there is a, a condition called Barrett's, and I, I go there because we have a question from Tyler asking if he can have a tiff if he has Barrett's. Can you talk a little bit about Barrett's, and then also the second part of that question, can he have a tiff? Sure. Yeah, Barrett's esophagus is change in the lining of the esophagus from reflux over time. Um, and it is technically a precancerous lesion. And if you leave it go and continue to have reflux, it can change into cancer. Um, and so 
There's different stages of Barrett's and it kind of depends what stage of Barrett's you're in. You can always have a, a tip with Barrett's. Now the question is, um, or any anti-reflux procedure for that matter, um, the question becomes how advanced is your Barrett's esophagus? And that's something you need a gastroenterologist to, to do an endoscopy and biopsies and determine where along the pathway are you. There's different stages, like I said, um, I'll tell you the names, not that this is something you need to remember, but it goes from intestinal metaplasia to low-grade dysplasia to high-grade dysplasia to cancer. So, you know, the, the first step, the intestinal metaplasia, is relatively low risk, and that's patients we just watch over time with biopsies. So if you have that, we often tell you, yes, absolutely, you can get the anti-reflux procedure and get it done, you know, as whenever you want. Now, if you start talking about having any of the dysplasias, now you're talking about something that has a higher risk of developing cancer. And what we tend to do and what a lot of people tend to do is get rid of the Barrett's esophagus first by either burning it away or freezing it away. And then once the Barrett's esophagus is gone, which sometimes takes anywhere from two to five or six or seven treatments, once that's gone, then you go back in and you do the, the, the TIF or whatever other anti-reflux procedure you want. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, this one's a long one, and then Andrea will shoot back over to you. But uh, okay. just want to see, Ben is asking two endoscopy, one colonoscopy, pH Bravo test scoring a 14.1. Yesterday I found out I have a small hiatal hernia uh, doing the barium, barium swallow test. My question is, what should I be expecting my doctor to do with these findings? I feel like every time I go to an appointment and tell them how I'm feeling and new symptoms, it, I, it's just always a, a brush off is not important. I'm scared that because of my low scoring and the hiatal hernia being small, it will be brushed off as not severe and I have to live with this condition forever. Question two, what should I do moving forward with these results? I've only gotten this far because of my personal research and these talks. Thank you. Um, it's a great question. I mean, there, there are some things that, you know, anybody that sees you would want more information on, including what type of symptoms you feel, how much, um, you know, what those endoscopies showed and what the Bravo actually shows. And, and there's other numbers other than the Demeester score that are important to, to help us determine how much reflux is going on. There's acid exposure time. There's number of reflux episodes. Um, so having that information can help. But if any of those suggest that you do have some reflux, it's not unreasonable to consider an anti-reflux procedure. Now, if your hiatal hernia is less than two centimeters, um, which it sounds like based on your description it probably is, then you could consider going straight to the, the TIF procedure and it may help your symptoms. Um, now, on the other hand, if it's larger, you may either consider a traditional fundoplication where they can repair the hernia, or you could do something co called a C-TIF or a combined TIF where a surgeon reduces the hiatal hernia and then um, GI or a surgeon will also do the TIF at the same time. Um, that's a pretty more common procedure these days than uh, you know it used to be and it's getting a lot of good data behind that now the real question is determining whether or not your symptoms are acid reflux related or not and so that really takes an astute eye somebody who does this for a living and figuring out are your symptoms reflux or are they not sometimes you can have something called uh, visceral hypersensitivity where essentially the nerves in your esophagus are overly sensitive to things and they, they feel th or they feel things that aren't necessarily there and doing an anti-reflux procedure is not going to help that and it may actually make you feel worse with your symptoms because you've just irritated nerves that are already hypersensitive so so it's important to really sit down with somebody that does this and go over all your data and and you know figure out what do we think is causing it and if it is reflux consider one of those procedures you know, I really appreciate you talking about the neural hypersensitivity because I, I don't know that I've actually, in the, the TIFF talks that I have been able to be on, I don't know that we've really touched on that, that subject much and how it ties into the importance of the diagnostic testing. So I appreciate you expounding on that. Thank you very much. I think a lot of our viewers will be interested to hear that. Um, 
last but not least, and then promise Andrea, sorry. I'm oh yeah, you're good. Throw it back to you, but uh, questions. Yeah. I, we're having a lot of questions come in just about your thoughts on staying on PPIs. I have a number of them that have been named with lots of very long names, um, yeah. but they're all <laughs> asking the same thing. Is a good Is it a good idea to take this for a long period of time? So yeah, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, and I think a lot of people probably jumped in after that, but um, the data is kind of a little bit mixed, but the risks of PPIs are low, but may exist. And it could be heart disease, bone disease, kidney disease, Alzheimer's. Um, those are the big ones that we talk about uh, as side effects of PPIs. Um, if you have real reflux though, the, the damage that reflux can cause and the risk associated with that is a lot higher than those uh, staying on those medicines and the possible risks that they could cause. So is it okay to stay on it long term? Absolutely. Is it also reasonable to consider an anti-reflux procedure and see if you can get off of those medicines? That's absolutely okay as well. And you know, that's something that no one can force you to make a decision, but it is something that you need to have a discussion with a physician about. Is it worth me staying on this medicine? Is it worth me considering an anti-reflux surgery? And if you, you know, you you are considering anti-reflux surgery, I always advise anybody that's considering it to have a full workup and not just jump into it without any further testing. The testing that I recommend is called an esophageal manometry, where we kind of measure your esophagus and see the function of the muscles of your esophagus. Because sometimes people think it's reflux and it actually turns out it's a different disorder with a muscle dysfunction that we would treat a totally different way. And also to consider the, the reflux testing, which is the pH testing with the tube in the nose or the chip in, in the esophagus that I spoke about and figure out, is it really reflux? And if it is, let's go ahead and, and start treating that. Very good. Okay, Andrea, back to you. Thanks. No, I, I I love it, and I'm I'm glad to hear that there's lots of questions and 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 see the lots of questions uh, after Malik for answering them. Um, I know that that we got a lot of viewers that come on and and can't wait to ask the doctor questions. So it's very valuable. Uh, before, um, so let's talk about recovery. We get lots of questions about recovery. What does that look like? Are they staying in the hospital overnight? Um, you know, what does the post-op uh, diet look like? Uh, the progression, maybe discuss a little bit of that. Yeah, if you don't. sure. So often, but not always, and I would say the majority of times you're going to have an overnight stay in the hospital. Um, but at times, you, you know, there are people that have gone home um, the same day for uh, a, a number of different reasons. Um, but um, usually it's an overnight stay. There is some pain associated with it. You are having a, a relatively sizable procedure done on the inside. Like I said, everything's on the inside. Um, so there's, you know, we try and make sure your pain is controlled and things like that. In terms of the diet recovery, so the first three days, you kind of stick to clear liquids like water, clear juices, soup broth, um, things like that. After the third day, you start progressing to what's called full liquids. Those are your thicker liquids, like your nutritional shakes and boost or adding protein powder to things. And then after two weeks, you can start soft food. And then for from like three to six weeks, you slowly advance the soft food until after about six or seven weeks, you get back to kind of a, a normal diet. Um, the other things post-op that you kind of worry about is like, lifting so within the first couple weeks you're you're sticking to kind of a five pound limit after that it goes up to 10 pounds for a few more weeks and then after that you can kind of get back to normal lifting physical activity particularly like in more you you can definitely walk you we encourage people to walk and be mildly active in that sense but more intense physical activity we'd ask you to wait about six weeks and and then also make sure you speak with your doctor before restarting it so we can make sure we feel like you're healed up appropriately before you do it because you don't want to damage the work that we've done on the inside by doing things too early fantastic thank you are there any considerations if they do get the hiatal hernia repair as well with the diff procedure does that change their post-op um, regimen if you will 
Um, I, I believe it's pretty similar other than maybe your hospital stay might be a little bit longer because now you do have incisions. Um, so, but for the most part, other than that, it, it's going to be pretty similar. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and um, I know I know you've been, we talked earlier before we started this uh, TIFF Talk Live, and I asked you how long you've been doing the TIFF procedure. Do you have any uh, stories or any comment on patients that you've done uh, the TIFF procedure on? Um, how how are they feeling or, or how have um, they fared after having the TIFF procedure? Yeah, so far we've had really great results with the TIFF procedure. One patient in particular had not just reflux, but also had gastroparesis, a slow emptying stomach, and has had reflux and regurgitation for years and years and years, even had a surgery um, to try and improve that, which was not her anti-reflux surgery, but to help her stomach emptying. Um, and ne could never get it fixed and and we finally um decided to do a tiff on her um you know there was a number of reasons we chose tiff over a traditional fund application um one of the bigger ones is because she had had several of surgeries in her abdomen before and it would have been very difficult and and they were near her stomach so it would have been a little more difficult for a surgeon to really get in there when you have a surgery before it can lead to what's called adhesions which makes it kind of sticky there and harder for surgeons to do their work and so we thought she would be a great candidate for a tiff and she had her tiff and immediately after she stopped regurgitating and wow. she said she hadn't bent over without regurgitating in years and years and immediately after the tip, no more regurgitation with bending over, so. Wow, that's a great success story. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Uh, she's probably super happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quality of life, right? Just changes yeah. dram dramatically. Uh, Wendy, I just wanted to pass it over to you uh, just to double check and make sure there's no other questions that have popped up. We do have a few more that have come okay. in. Um, popular. <laughs> Debra, who and and these are these are a little more um you know kind of off the beaten path as far as the question track goes. So, um I I do have uh, Debra saying that uh, in 2016 I had a Nissen fund application. I still have acid reflux and still take meds. I had a barium test. It took a pill five minutes to digest. My doctor says my Nissen wrap is too tight, but he is not willing to do anything to help. I have a lar uh, I have a burp after eating, which comes after I eat or drink. That's long, loud, and out of my control. Help, please, and thank you. <laughs> Any uh, thoughts to offer there? Yeah. So, um, I mean, if the Nissen fund application is too tight, um, that would probably mean that barium pill actually got stuck in the esophagus without getting past that fund application for five minutes, and, and that's another reason. I'm big on doing testing beforehand because sometimes if you have weak esophagus muscles and you do a fullness and fund application, this is one of the issues you can have where things get stuck in the esophagus. So um, the benefit of a, a TIF is that it's what's called partial. And so it's not as tight. It allows things to go down a little bit easier, but still have that reflux barrier. Um, so different things that can be tried when you have a, a a Nissen that's too tight, you can try a balloon stretch of the um, the Nissen. Um, usually we use a TTS balloon, which is a through the scope balloon, just meaning we can stretch it open a little bit there and see if that helps. Um, sometimes if the muscles are tight, which you would need that manometry test for, um, we consider Botox injections, although with a fund application, that's usually not as effective, but it's something to consider. Um, or the other option is to find somebody that'll go in there and take down the fund application and either redo it or, or leave it down and consider doing a TIF um, to see if you can get improvement. But it does take, you know, sometimes for that, you really need to go to a more specialized center, um, some a center that's like a tertiary care center, usually a university setting, setting with somebody that does a lot of fund applications and TIF and other things where you have a, a, a team of GI and surgeons that, that do a lot of these. Thank you very much. We also have a question about uh, the TIF procedure and asking if it's reversible. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the TIF per procedure is reversible. So it can be taken down. Um, 
it is also it does not prevent you from getting any other type of reflux surgery so um if the tiff if it's done and for whatever reason it's not working for you a surgeon can still do a fundiplication um if you know you were to consider doing a strata which is the burning of the esophagus that can still be done so it is reversible and it option still open um so yes but usually hopefully it works well enough that you don't have to consider that thank you very much also have allison asking if endoscopy shows a two centimeter hiatal hernia a manometry shows some failed peristalsis and a ph study shows loss of acid reflux is tiff possible yeah your two centimeters is right on that borderline of going to a a tiff without a hiatal hernia repair um and so you know somebody that does tiff would probably want to do their own endoscopy before um you know committing to just doing a tiff or doing that combined tiff or you know the the other options of surgery so you want to get somebody that that's really done a lot of these to do an endoscopy and measure that hiatal hernia for you and tell you yes, this is something that I could fix with just the TIF alone, or no, we need a surgeon involved one way or the other. Which, perfect segue, I have Philip asking regarding that that combined procedure where you have the, the gastroenterologist and the surgeon with, a, with a, a combined procedure with the hiatal hernia, is that procedure covered by insurance? Yeah, yeah, you, I mean, at least at our institute we make sure everything is covered before we do it um we're not going to put you through something that you're going to have to pay out of pocket for um but yes it, it is a procedure that is con covered by insurance typically so um and, and most places will always make sure of that before they start operating on you very good thank you okay andrea back to you Fantastic. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you, Dr. Malik. Uh, before we conclude this evening, and thank you everyone who's been asking lots of questions. We really appreciate it. Uh, before we conclude, Dr. Malik, uh, just want to give you the opportunity to provide your best advice that you would give to anyone that might be suffering uh, from GERD today. So, I mean, if you're suffering with any symptoms, heartburn, reflux, that sour taste in your mouth, a burning feeling in your stomach or your chest, or even any of those other symptoms we talked about, like the cough and worsened asthma and they can't figure out why or um, anything like that. It's important to see a gastroenterologist and make sure that you don't have anything else funny going on or abnormal. And, and it's definitely okay to start with medications as we talked about and lifestyle things. Um, but if those aren't working or the medicines work great for you, but you don't really want to stay on medicines. Um, find somebody that can can help and talk to you about doing an anti-reflux type procedure. Now, not everybody needs an anti-reflux procedure. If you're really well controlled on medicines and you don't want to go through a surgery, that's absolutely okay. Um, you know, after discussing what medicines can do and knowing that and, and knowing the risk is very minimal but can exist. But if you're somebody that wants to get off medicine or medicine helps but you're still having symptoms despite medicine then really consider um, somebody that can do some type of anti-reflux procedure for you fantastic thank you thank you uh and before we end uh can they see a gastroenterologist and or a general surgeon or a surgeon or should they always get a referral from a gastroenterologist first um so you can see both. I've actually had uh, my my surgical partners at Temple refer patients to me to, you know, because they got somebody that called them about doing an anti-reflux surgery. And, you, you know, the one thing I, I think is important when you're doing anti-reflux is, is really having a good team, not just one person that's kind of taking care of everything and not letting you see the options that are out there so if, if somebody's trying to sell you on one procedure and one procedure al alone and not giving you options you know sometimes i hesitate with that because i think people need to discuss options you know what surgical options what medical options what different types of surgical options or procedural options do you have and if you have that then yeah feel comfortable with either a surgeon or a gastroenterologist but a lot of times like i said we do it as a team um my surgeons and I work very closely. We meet actually, you know, very regularly every other week to to discuss patients and to 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 make sure we all feel like we're doing the right thing. And so um, that kind of team.
team environment is really when I think we provide the best care for each patient. Fantastic. I love that uh, team environment idea. Um, as they always say, every patient is different, right? And not all not all um, procedures or, or treatment options are, are good for everybody. So um, I, I appreciate that. And um, again, if you are in the uh, Philadelphia area, you can yep. see Dr. Malik. Um, if you're not, you're welcome to go to girdhelp.com. That is our uh, website. And there is a physician locator on there. You can type it in your zip code or state and you'll be able to find a TIF trained physician in your area. In addition to that, we just launched, um, I don't, wanted to make sure I let you guys know, we did launch a new app um, for, it's a mobile app. It is called the GERD Help mobile app. Uh, you can just find it on either your Apple application or your Android and just type in GERD Help and you'll be able to find that app on there. There's lots of articles, information about GERD. Um, you re can record your symptoms. Um, so it's a nice little tool that you can use to kind of walk you through your progression um, if you do have GERD. So. Um, Dr. Malik, I can't thank you enough again for joining us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate it at EGS. And I know that everybody watching, you have quite a few people watching tonight um, that have asked a lot of questions, really um, appreciated and enjoyed it as well. So thank you for your expertise. Yeah. And um, yeah, and for all of you watching, we're here every Tuesday night. Actually, next week we will be on Wednesday night. So put that on your calendar. We'll be on Wednesday night, 3 p.m. Pacific. Uh, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern time. So you can catch us next week. Uh, uh, but until then, please uh, take care of yourselves. And thank you for joining us this evening. Have a great evening. Thank you.